I'm Elizabeth Nickrens, and I just wanted to come back to a question raised earlier today by Mary Phillips, which I thought that um, Tyrone Cannon's talk also spoke to, and so I wanted to get some reactions from the group and from the audience, which is, um, Dr. Phillips said, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be wonderful to know at five what your fate was at 18? And I thought that was such a thought-provoking question, and maybe not a rhetorical question, but an empirical one. Um, fortunately, we have a lot of people who are doing work on what it is like to live under the description of a condition. And so I wanted to ask for if people have had experience or thoughts or have done research on what the outcome is of this kind of early knowledge and growing up and forming an identity under, under this description of risk. I just wanted to raise that question for the group. Well, it, would, it, it makes a tremendous difference whether there's a cure for the disease or not, <laughs> right? So if you get a, if you get a genetic uh, test for Huntington's disease and you find your brain to get it, some people commit suicide. On the other hand, if you had a prodromal biomarker for schizophrenia and there was actually an effective treatment early, uh, that would be huge. And I, I would just add that because uh, I think the Huntington's analogy is great, because uh, that's a case where you have a very highly valid test, right? If you have the Huntington's allele you, and you live long enough, you, you will get Huntington's disease. Here, the, the situation is compounded, but, but there's no treatment, right, uh, yet. Here, the situation is compounded. There's, there's no treatment, and there's a very infallible basis for prediction. So I think young people, uh, at, at this stage of our knowledge, um, that inf I, I don't think we're, we're likely to encounter exactly the scenario that you, that you outline, at least for another few years, in, until, until prediction uh, begins to approach the, the level of, of Huntington's. But, but that seems like a very tall order for something as heterogeneous and, and complexly determined. Okay, do we have another question? Mr. Kendall. I found the similarity between Kay's life story and Ellen's life story so similar, and I wonder whether we can have elaboration from the two of them. I mean, uh, the idea of having psychotherapy with severe mental illness is itself um, a little bit surprising in the modern era where psychotherapy is sort of a downplay, but to have psychoanalysis with schizophrenia is practically unheard of. When I was a house officer at Harvard, schizophrenic patients were routinely treated with analytically oriented psychotherapy. And that was one of the first studies that showed that it doesn't really work very well for schizophrenia. So obviously, it's sort of the combination of things that's important. And I wonder whether the two of them might comment on this. Why don't we start off with Ellen first? Um, I think it is the case that uh, people don't think psychodynamic, certainly psychoanalytic therapy is indicated for people with schizophrenia. I'm here to tell you that it is for some people. Um, and I try to think of the different ways it's been helpful. And that's sort of the $60,000 question with all therapy. Is it relationship? Is it insight or whatever? And I think of a number of things that have helped me, and they're not only unique to psychoanalysis. And one is... Um, you know, stress is bad for our illness, in particular mental illness, and to be able to understand your triggers and either learn to cope with them or avoid them is very important. Another thing that I think is important is that part of the resistance to taking something else that's essential to medication is the narcissistic injury of having the illness and working through those feelings of damage and, and defectiveness is really important uh, in, in one's recovery. I think having a place you can bring your frightening thoughts. I mean, I think some therapists have the goal don't say those, get the patient not to articulate those or say those out loud. For me, having a place that I could say them safely was very important and it let me not say them in, in my working uh, world. Um, uh, what, what else? I, mean, I think interpretations can detoxify uh, symptoms, not always. I mean, some people think that psychotic symptoms are just random firings of neurons. Some think they're meaningful, but interpreting doesn't help when the person's experiencing them. And some people think that sometimes it can help. Um, in the last group. I don't think it can always help, but it sometimes can help. And then finally, the relationship. You know, having someone who accepts you not only for the good, but also the bad and the ugly is enormously empowering. Um, 
Another way to think about this is that you know people with schizophrenia are people too, and we have relationship issues and we have work issues that can be addressed through psychotherapy. And I think of kind of current research trends like Steve Martyr doing studies not just in reduction and remission of symptoms, but quality of life. And I think therapy helps with quality of life. So on lots of different, uh, in lots of different vectors, I think it can be very helpful complement to medication. And I know the early studies didn't involve medication. It'll be interesting to study both psychotropic medication and good <laughs> intensive therapy. And there's another thing that maybe you would comment on, Kay. The, what is common also between the two of you is that you're highly intelligent. And intelligent is a form of ego strength. And I just wonder whether the outcome studies that have been done on people who have recovered successfully have taken that into consideration. Yes, but not always to the advantage of, uh, I mean, in schizophrenia, for example, there's some literature that suggests that it is the more highly intelligent early on in their disease who kill themselves because of the increased insight of the unraveling of their future um, through the illness. So it's, it's complicated, I think. I think that, I, ha I don't think I can add to uh, Professor Sachs' comments. They were terrific about psychotherapy. I, I would emphasize the fact that not taking medication is a psychological issue. It's not a medical issue. Right. Um, but it has enormous medical uh, implications. And that uh, the relationship with a, with a good doctor is hugely important. Uh, the problem is, as we all know, is it's really, really good doctor. I would also <laughs> add one other thing to your point, Dr. Kendall, about intelligence or not. I, I, don't, I don't know the research if it's a good prognostics or not. For me, the thing that's important is that I like working. I like thinking. I like yeah. writing. And, and to that extent, my whatever intelligence I've had has really helped me kind of navigate mm -hmm. having this illness. Um, yes, the gentleman in the back. Um, as much a comment as a question. Um, to Alan Sachs, I think you know everything you said today is just so um, courageous, and everyone, a lot of people owe an amazing debt to you, and so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Kano, I think. And 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 oh so a, qu a, a question that I think, I just. If you have a thought, there, there seems to be this tension between the recognition of a biological process taking place that might mediate aspects of this disorder and a contrasting notion that willpower can overcome the manifestation of, 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 those, of that discomfort. And so I'd like to hear your thoughts. I don't believe it has anything to do with willpower. I mean, on the other hand, my little brother used to say, even when I was a teenager, that I was the most stubborn person he ever met. So that probably, I mean, it cut both ways. You know, it made me resist treatment, uh, but it also made me resist the dire prognoses. I think mine is not the story of willpower, but the story of someone into whom enormous treatment resources were invested. I mean, four and five day a week therapy, great psychopharmacology, supportive family and friends, accommodating workplace. I'm not just, you know, this. It's not willpower, it's, it's health and resources, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question that has a lot of other stuff, but please, because I think the question was about the similarities, actually. Yeah. And well, and um, we're talking about treatment resources and, and access to psychotherapy and medication. I mean, these are all things that are largely absent where I work. I mean, there's, uh, talking about psychoanalysis, there's one psychoanalyst for 200 million people in Indonesia. And um, uh, on yeah, I was going to yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he mostly treats uh, foreigners. So really, they're, you know. Um, and I, I, and I, it would be interesting to have a conversation you know, looking at, at Pak Kreta, who by some models has, has something like schizophrenia. Though, uh, as I made the film, as, as Mary Jo noted, I, I've been working on this for a while. And I've, I've, it's only in the latest kind of cut that I, and I've, and I've also written a number of articles on this, and, I've, and I've, I've finally came to the view, yeah, this, this is something really like schizophrenia, though it took, it took a long time. But it, this, is a, this is a man uh, whose outcome, by most measures, is quite good. He's married, he has children, he's been able to work, he's gone through horrific experiences, major stressors in his life, um, but largely without what we're talking about here in, in a, a biomedical frame. Um, 
and largely the, what the point, one of the points we're making is he's not labeled. I mean, the, in, in, in fact, in the beginning of the film, we, we very clearly show that people, while they consider it odd, they don't consider it as a form of madness or insanity or, or mental illness. So he's protected by the lack of a biomedical label. And no, that's, that's not a generalization, because I have another s film in the same series where a woman has Tourette's and she doesn't have a biomedical label and, and she's seen as mad and she has very poor outcomes because people, her social world um, is quite toxic to her. So um, I think it's, it's, it's labeling. It's a supportive family environment. Um, it's a lack of, actually, toxins I think Byron would, would support. It's a lack of uh, basically drug abuse in, in rural Indonesia. That has a, that's a, that we, we forget that that's very much a part of our landscape, and it's not a part of the landscape everywhere in the world, but it's certainly in, on the increase. So there's a number of factors that, that, none of which specifically psychiatric or biomedical, really shape outcome of, of, of severe mental illness. I just wanted to add to Dr. Kandel's notion of uh, ego strength. I agree intelligence is very important, but uh, we could also mention a strong sense of humor in both women and tenacity, tremendous tenacity and resilience uh, under incredible stress. Those are not ordinary traits. They're very special strengths. I think they're very important. I assume I've worked for many years, decades, with some people suffering from both bipolar and schizophrenic illness, and the ones who have always done well are those who exactly have those traits. Those are traits that are essential to the fighting of any terrible disease to conquer. I know a woman very well who's a post five year survivor of advanced pancreatic cancer, who is an amazing woman, who is a triathlete, and she was just determined that cancer was not going to kill her, and it didn't. So I think these are issues of uh, resilience that really need further exploration as well. Thank you very much. psychotic illnesses. I mean, this is an interesting contrast between psychotherapy on the one hand and psychoanalysis on the other. Has there any been any attempt to do? No, there certainly are. I mean, uh, most of the studies have been done on variations of cognitive therapy, which tend to show good outcomes, particularly in bipolar illness. Yeah, Some very studies. No, I mean, there really has been very little. I mean, there was a recent study that was pretty flawed of psychoanalytic work. I think it's, it's a very hard thing to do because it's very hard to, it, as long as you can make up a manual, the kind of psychotherapy that cognitive psychotherapy is, not everybody's going to sign up for it for sure and, and not everybody's going to profit from it, but you can study it and it certainly has good results. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from the back and then we have some other hands.